Gentlemen, welcome to The Hammer. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you so much for joining us. I um, thought we would just start off. Um, you, Mark, have worked with Bradley before, but as an actor, not as a director, right? So um, you worked with him on Licorice Pizza most recently, other films, Joker as a producer, but. And Silver Linings Playbook. Right. And uh, so, you know, it wasn't much of a stretch to, because I'm still working with him as an actor. True. But then, you know, he has his big picture of the whole project. So, and that's my job too, is to make that vision come true. So it was, it was quite a pleasant experience, having had the experience with him and the trust that we built over the years. Yeah. And Kazu, this was your first time working with him but you, I had read, had already started thinking about Bernstein before Bradley spoke to you about this project? Uh, yes, because uh, when I was 19, which is uh, <laughs> 36 Three. years ago, <laughs> uh, I saw a documentary about him when I was still in Japan, and uh, he really inspired me uh, because he was in Japan uh, doing a rehearsal with a student for the concert. And uh, while he was talking to the student, really inspired me to be, uh, you know, like a best in uh, art field. So, and I saw someday I want to walk on the film about Leonard Bernstein. And, yeah. <laughs> so you have arrived and you both excelled tremendously, but you had an incredible challenge or set of challenges with this film. You had um, to span several decades. You had to... Um, create looks that worked in both black and white and color, or you had to adjust your, your process to accommodate a film that was in both black and white and color. And you had to deal with eras that people who are alive today knew or know, right? So it's familiar. You, you weren't talking about an era which, you know, people would disassociate because they hadn't lived through necessarily. So in a sense, you're, you're, challenges making ma many movies in one, right? It's not one period. It's not one look um, consistently throughout. Um, maybe each of you will, will tack them bit by bit, but um, the different eras, maybe that was um, a fun challenge, but it also, again, required you to do a, a lot more research. So let's say the 40s and the 50s era in the black and white, and then 60s and 70s into the 80s. Mark, do you want to start just like, what was your research project um, process like? How long did it take to build all of those looks for the different eras? It's interesting. We began working together really with those camera tests, with the makeup, like in the summer of 2020. Maybe you were even earlier, but when we started to put things with costumes so he could see the whole overlook, that was like in 2020. Wow. So, um, you know, we we were dressing Lenny and, and trying to figure out who he was for that long. And then when production finally came in, you know, I spent the month here in L.A. Um, but, you know, we had the luxury. We were supposed to shoot it like a year earlier, and then we got postponed by COVID. So then I'm looking at how many, how long my research project was. You know, uh, things came up, and I was researching in 2020 and 2021, and, and then we were shooting in 2022. So it was, it was quite a long time, um, you know, and we worked in New York and we were all in the same building so we were able to really consult with each other and I had done a film called The Artist which was black and white so I had learned a lot about textures and and the middle values of colors that all look the same in black and white so and I love classic films so you look at what designers did in those classic films especially like MGM or Adrian how you they you draw your eye to the leading actress or or you lead the audience's eye with contrast to where they're supposed to look so i tried to slip that in and kazu for you um the 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 eras align with aging right so maybe talk a little bit about your process in taking a face a recognizable face and uh working through the aging process that you have to then layer in um, 
black and white versus color. And I actually have to say I'm not aware if in your process in prosthetic makeup there is a big difference shooting black and white or color. Yes. Uh, so, you know, as soon as I got the script from Bradley, uh, that was the time we went into the uh, pandemic. And uh, I had uh, some time because I, I think it was like a two thousand. He contacted me two thousand like early two thousand twenty, right before the pandemic, and so I read the script and start to gather uh, references, like uh, images and videos and uh, uh, DVDs. Because uh, great thing about the Lenny was so well documented, yeah. and uh, I end up like uh, correcting uh, like a uh, sixteen hundred photographs. And uh, based on the script, I divided each, you know, like I separate each stages of the age. And uh, um, I was starting to th think about the design. And uh, I end up seeing Bradley, uh, I think 2020, uh, August. And that was a time I did a scan and the head cast of him and the body scan. And uh, I had to change his body shape too for the aging too. So uh, I got uh, five different uh, live cast, uh, the head cast, and I started to sculpt uh, each stages. And um, the tricky part was, uh, you know, Bradley is not too far out from Lenny, but of course it's, there's a big difference. So uh, I started from uh, making a nose plug to widening his nose. And the prosthetic, like a young stage, he had the nose and lips because it's a, you know, like when people are younger, the lip is fuller. And as we get older, the <laughs> lip gets thinner. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry to <laughs> point that out. But <laughs> what pillars, happens. pillars. <laughs> <laughs> but that what happens. And uh, also, you know, like when we age, we start to shrink down, you know. And, uh, uh, so based on Bradley's face, you know, like a tricky part was uh, Lenny was more like a gaunt face. He had a more cheekbones, yeah. but the Bradley has a full cheek. So I had to create that uh, by adding a prosthetic and make uh, make him look like it has a you know like a sunken cheek. And um, so. The, uh, you know, because it's uh, likeness is the one thing it's important, and the aging is a gradually age, believably, and uh, also many people knows what Lenny look like each ages. So I had to think about what is the most important element that people, how people recognize Lenny's look. So I designed based on that, uh, and. Uh, yeah, of course, like a pr prosthetic is, I had to glue on him on a, on a bloodly. So the thicker it is, it will harder for him to move his face. So I had to kind of design, still give him a space to move. And uh, of course, like a last stage, he was fully covered because it, I had to do a more sculpting and the design on him and the modification on his face. So, um, so that that was quite difficult, and uh, I also had to age his arm and everything. And the black and white part <coughs> is I used to do a, a the, the chemical photograph, and uh, uh -huh. I printed myself and developed everything. So I kind of knew how the skin tone turned into, you know, like a change yeah. as a you know value of black and white. So that was helpful. And so what I did was, uh, it's not simply makeup, because if you put the makeup on, it will be kind of too smooth. So what I did was uh, I created an uh, element of the color in existing on the skin and painted with each color. It's like a, I used like a eight different colors to create the layer of the color of the skin tone. So even like a, it will be, it was uh, photographed in black and white. It still looked like a skin. And that was in the prosthetic itself? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. So, again, back to the original, um, or one of my original points, is that people, again, who will see this movie, knew Lenny, right? And they knew Felicia. And so you had um, some key references in 
the interviews that they, the televised interviews they did, the, the public screening, and just, you know, the images that we are familiar with, but how much leeway did you have to invent looks um, that would have been from the era? Yeah, it's a very well-documented life, and, and we I look at the beats of the script, you know, there is one or two photographs. I think I only worked with one for his debut, and then... Uh, he, there's a, a picture, an autograph, photograph that he does, and I'm like, okay, I see what a young man wore in 1943. And and then if, if it works, don't fix it. I mean, I'm not slavishly copying that, but it has the essence of things. And then there are things that are, there's no reference, and this is what I think this person that I came to know so well would wear. It's, I think it was more so with Felicia. Um, there are things that there are striking photographs of him. He wears that uh, striped shirt and the neckerchief at rehearsal in the 70s. And I look at that, and it's a very small period in his life when he had the beard. Uh, and it's perfect for what that scene is about. It's really Lenny. He presented himself to the world at that time like that. So why not use it? And then there was a very tiny photograph in Jamie's famous father girl book that she wrote. And it's uh, Lenny in a, a white jumpsuit. And it's also for that period. And I thought that's perfect for that small period of time. This is what he was going through. He was trying to be liberated. So you see things that have re will have resonance in the script that I'm given. And honestly, I could see no reason why not to use it. So this is a um, follow-on to that, a question for both of you. This idea in, in both of your work, your creation, realness versus invention, and um, what Bradley's direction to you was um, in like how, how close to what someone might perceive as a real um, kind of facsimile of a look or um, this is cinema, so invention is, is in, in its nature. What was Bradley and what was your collaboration ultimately? Uh, Kazu, maybe you could start. Yes, uh, you know, so Bradley never had this, this amount of the prosthetic on his face before. So the first test was just for him to feel it, you know, how it kind of, how he felt about, you know, like having a, Lots of stuff on his yeah. face, you know, like because it's uh, it's it's quite different. But we we made it very very soft, so he realized it. He he didn't actually feel that much of a difference as his own face, and so um, let me see. I lost <laughs> the uh, so yeah. That was a process, and as we. Because the first test was an internal test, which is at my my studio, and then we did the film test at uh, Disney Concert Hall, and uh, that was kind of rare because usually the kind of film test, first film test, is happens will happen like a corner of the small studio, yeah. just a camera lighting. But uh, actually, we we did full on test like uh, five different stages. And uh, in the two days, and that's we don't do with that with clothes. Yeah, with clothing, <laughs> wow. like costume. And uh, Gust Gustav Dudamel was there to help Bali how to conduct, and uh, Steven Sp Spielberg was there. And, you know, we were quite nervous about it, <laughs> but <laughs> <No> stress. <laughs> yeah, because we don't do that usually. Yeah. And so, and we did that, and eventually we kind of find out like a good balance using his own face and uh, give an essence of a bloody. And the important part is uh, bloody really embodied Lenny. It was really amazing to see how he changed voices, voice on each stages, and as he get older, more like a raspy and a deeper voice. And also the... Uh, um, the believability wise, uh, the good thing was uh, we had uh, Bernstein kids uh, checking every you know time we did the test, and uh, after a few tests, uh, actually Alexander, uh, his son, was uh, uh, started to cry because it's, it looked like a, his dad, 
And uh, the other thing was uh, when we did the Eevee Cathedral scene, yeah. uh, London Sym uh, Symphony Folk... <laughs> Symphony Orchestra. Or yeah. Symphony Orchestra members, some member actually played for Lenny, and they came up to me. You know, I really felt like I was playing for Lenny, and so that was a good proof. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, Mark, I was thinking as I was watching. You know, not only do Lenny and Felicia go through various waves or stages of their life, right? They age through this. They also kind of retrench and blossom as human beings, right? They, they have highs, they have lows, you know, especially Felicia has to reconcile with so much that has changed in her own life. And um, I wondered, and that's translated through your work, both of your work. Um, I was wondering specifically with the way you dress her, way you costume her when she's flourishing, was there a different feel, look to what she was wearing versus when she was, you know, kind of had to pull back from the whole Lenny of it all? And mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, we be, I, I look at photographs and I make up some kind of story of what she must be going through and probably the same way that you do the various stages of the makeup, you know, this is Youthful, the photographs we see of her are very well tailored, very chic. Um, certainly she took on the role of Mrs. Maestro, but she had her own career. They had means, you know, and what that translates into is a, a kind of tailoring and a kind of uh, smartness. You know, she got her hair done at Kenneth at the plaza and, you know, so she, you knew what kind of woman she was and you can make educated choices about these different turns of her life. But things like the Chanel suit that she wears um, when they go to the park after the doctors, you know, I think that was in the script. Hmm. And, uh, you know, I thought it was a very interesting thing to be in the script. And I didn't say, like, why is she in a suit? I thought that's very astute. You know, sometimes you wear it as protection and armor. If you look good, nothing could possibly bad news could come, you know. So um, you just learn these people and you look at their beats and you, I'm also trying to tell a story. What What is the world like and, and what are the mores of 1943 or 1971? You think of that change there, you know, and even from the beginning of the 70s to the end of the 70s. So I'm just constantly trying to be specific about time and place for each of them and, and how they would have changed. And Kazu, it, it kind of struck me that not only do we age um, and our bodies and our faces change, sometimes we're just tired. Mm -hmm. And there were moments in the film, especially with Felicia, where I'm like, is that, is that Kazu? Or, you know, like, is that her? I mean, obviously she's giving the performance, but you did do some uh, prosthetics work on, on Carrie as well. Is that right? Yeah, uh, actually... I designed two different stages, but uh, right before the filming, uh, Bradley decided to bring down the look of that age younger. And at that time, I was already so busy with the Lenny st stuff. So uh, those makeup was done by uh, Sean Grigg and Duncan German. And so when Bradley decided to uh, bring the age down younger, uh, 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 Duncan made a very small piece, so and the neck, and uh, and they used a uh, nose I made because it, when we age, nose changes too, and the earlobes, and so that was that. But uh, you know, good point is that uh, the question you said was uh, you know like because they went through so many different emotions and the health condition and also when Lenny conducting he was sweating a lot too, and so every scene I changed the skin tone and how much how red his face is and also added the sweat and depend on the scene like when he was depressed. Uh, it's like a kind of shadow, shadow down around the eyes and cheek, and uh, so, so it it makes more sense because uh, you know with the prosthetic, the one issue with the prosthetic is the skin tone doesn't show through it, so I had to recreate the uh, 
physical state by adding a color or changing the color. Yeah. That's remarkable. Um, look, we are in the presence of two double Oscar winners here, which is a rare treat. Possibly triple, who knows? Um, you both had such remarkable careers. Um, uh, we are near uh, a campus. We're in a city filled with other artists, fellow artists. Any advice you would give? And Kazu, maybe I'll start with you because you have an amazing trajectory as well. You, you did step away from this work, from cinema work for a while to pursue your, your art and your, uh, your own practice. And then you came back and you're roaring back. And since then, it's been great. Just talk a little bit about... Um, yeah, your your tr career trajectory and and um, any advice you would have for someone for the kind of longevity and success that you both have enjoyed. Uh, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, you know what I think. It's important thing is. I th I think you know like uh, art is a form of a healing process. I believe, and uh, the more. <laughs> I had a, like a childhood trauma, and uh, when I started, it was a process of healing, I think, and to heal others too by creating something. And so, and uh, also inspiration, what inspired you when you were a kid, and that stays in you, and you have to keep burning that fire in you. And so I believe Bradley has that too because he was inspired by conductor and uh, you know ba um, Bucks Bunny was it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so you know we had that fire in us, and uh, it's kind of perfect timing we closed that you know. And so I think um, we just have to understand what we really want to do, and uh, we really dedicate our life and uh, make a commitment and keep pushing ourselves and that's the only thing we can do because uh you know when we stop that we feel like you feel like uh or not accomplishing or you're not making your life you know so um i think it's just a, a revengeous effort that's only it takes and uh, you know I, I i really feel fortunate that we had that in us like uh, as an art and uh, we, we, we it's like a that's a that's the best thing to have because it's like a you know it's very each it shows how unique each of us are so yeah. just to keep doing effort i think yeah. I love that. I also, I love that for sure. I love also the idea of Bradley Cooper being inspired by conductors in Bugs Bunny. This year, two great roles, Leonard Bernstein and Rocket Raccoon, right? <laughs> Any Guardians of the Galaxy fans here? Um, Mark, um, not only are you a double Oscar winner, I, you also won a prize for giving one of the shortest Oscar speeches in history. <laughs> And I was, it had this very uncanny moment, which happens every once in a while if you're fortunate. So I was researching this and recalling that. And I turned to look across the restaurant and there's Helen Mirren. Oh my gosh, that's fantastic. And why wow. would that be relevant? Would you yeah. share it? Well, yeah. <laughs> because as luck would have it, you know, Jimmy Kimmel's wife thought up a gag. Why don't we give a jet ski to the person who does the shortest speech <laughs> at the Oscars? And I usually make a short speech because I figure no one wants to hear the costume designer yammer on. And I actually forgot a sentence that I was going to say. So it's just on and off. And all night, I didn't realize this. They're like, Mark Bridges still in the running is his first place for the jet ski. And... Um, they came and got me from the audience, and I was like, oh, no. <laughs> and, um, yeah, they take me backstage. There's Helen Mirren being, you know, the Carol Merrill of the uh, jet ski. And they go, okay, get up on the jet ski. So there's a jacket, life jacket there. I just react. I put it on. And uh, I'm thinking, like, Gene Kelly and Singing in the Rain, dignity, always <laughs> dignity. And uh, Helen Mirren says, uh, 
oh, I like to poke holes in dignity sometimes. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. Oh, that sounds good. So then that kind of loosened me up and gave me permission. And we were just going to go have a good fun. So I figured how to hold it and was I was going to do some you know, the thank you waves on the way out. And um, it ended the show and it was, it was a great moment and everybody congratulated me on the jet ski and everybody <laughs> forgot I got an Oscar that night. <laughs> so other, other than brevity wins jet skis, any other advice or <laughs> sage advice for the- Brevity wins jet skis, uh, <laughs> try to keep it short. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's, I'm very fortunate because I do a job uh, that combines everything that I naturally am drawn to. You know, color, fabric, drawing, painting, history, actors, character development, you know, just everything. Research, you know, um, I, in one job. So I am very, very lucky. I think, I think, you, I think you're so right about, you know, you, it's a, a fire that you've had since you were a child. Um, certainly the seeds were there. You look back, first grade, second grade book reports that I do, the seed was there. You know, it's one foot in front of the other. You continue to do your best and let the chips fall where they may. And, um, you know, just try to choose things that inspire you and make you want to get up and go every morning to create. Thank you both for being here. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. <laughs>